Hi everyone, welcome back. You've officially made it to your last lecture of the summer semester. Yay! In today's class, we will continue our discussion of complex societies in the Americas by focusing on the Aztec Empire. So just as we saw in the Andes in lecture 5.2, archaeologists have divided up Central American history into a series of different time periods, starting in the pre-agricultural archaic period, roughly 7,000 BC, and moving into the formation of complex city-states, culminating with the Aztec Empire in the 16th century. The Aztec, like the Inca, can be considered to have controlled an empire, which can be defined as an extensive group of states or countries ruled over by a single monarch, an oligarchy, or a sovereign state. So how did the Aztec Empire come to be? Well, around 1100 CE, city-states began competing for resources and regional dominance within central Mexico. By 1400 CE, several small empires had begun to form. The most dominant were the Texacoco and Azcatlzaco. In 1434, the Azapotalca Az forces were defeated by a triple alliance of Texacoco, Tenochtitlan, and Clalpan. This alliance of Texacoco, Tenochtitlan, and Clalpan underwent a campaign of territorial expansion eventually leading to the Tenochtitlan's dominance. The ruler of Tenochtitlan became the supreme emperor over all of the, these, imperial for, these imperial areas that you see behind me and placed the capital of the empire in Tenochtitlan. The Aztec Empire continued to expand from 1430 onward through military conquest in which men for the army were supplied by allies and conquered states. The Aztec also used diplomacy and royal marriage to gradually grow the empire. The Aztec Empire was, co was a connected network of minor states and cities that stretched across over 130,000 square kilometers. The total population of the empire at its height was roughly 11. Tenochtitlan was located in the middle of Lake Texacoco and had a population of more than 200,000, comparable in size to Cusco, which we talked about in Lecture 5.2. Forty pyramids adorned with fine decorated stone working, uh, were surrounding this um, city, which was divided into about 60 to 70 well-organized wards or large residential areas. Tenochtitlan had six major canals that ran through the city, and people used canoes to move through the city, kind of like modern-day Venice. There were three major causeways which connected the city with the coastline. Tenochtitlan was not the only was not only a political center, but also at the religious heart of the Aztec Empire. It had a sacred precinct which contained 78 separate structures, including temples to the sun and to other earth goddesses. 
The city was also a major trading center in gold, turquoise, cotton, cacao, tobacco, pottery, weapons, foodstuffs, and slaves. It also contained monumental architecture and elaborate form of, of artwork, particularly seen in this temple complex depicted behind me. In this primary temple complex known as Templo Mayor, you see uh, two, two uh, main pyramids that contained wooden statues of the primary Aztec gods, Tlaloc and Huasicopochitl. Tlaloc god was the god of storms, floods, and droughts and it was used to mark the summer solstice and was his image in in this templo mayor was painted in blue in order to depict the presence of water the partner god of Klokuk was Wazikopochitl who was the god of sun war gold and rulers this god marked the winter solstice and was painted in red to emulate blood and warfare. Templo Mayor was surrounded by a large wall covered with giant carved stone snake reliefs. These walls stood 180 feet high with four distinct tiers. As we discussed among the Inca, there's also evidence at Tenochtitlan that the Aztec engaged in human sacrifice. These sacrifices uh, came in the form of food, flowers, or precious goods like shells. And at certain times, these sacrifices came in the form of blood from animals and non-fatal bloodletting by priests and humans. These kind of human sacrifices only occurred during important state events like the new fire ceremony which was celebrated every 52 years to mark the end of a complete solar cycle. These sorts of sacrifices were also made during important gods birthdays or coronations. Sacrifice was believed to be the best way to gain favor with the rain and war gods and was considered to be a form of payment for sacrifices the gods had made to create the world in the first place. Sacrificial victims were usually war captives, but children were also sacrificed. These victims were stretched over stones while priests ripped out their hearts and then dismembered their bodies. The remaining corpse of the human sacrifices were flung on top of round stones at the base of Templo Mayor, which depicted one of the key goddesses of the Aztec pantheon. Their heads were then displayed on racks at the base of the pyramid. As you might be getting the picture, Aztec religion played an important part in statecraft of this empire. The religious pantheon was centered upon these rain and war gods, as well as other gods like Quasquiotl, the plumed serpent, the supreme god of Texacoco, the god of fire, the hunting god, the god of death, and the earth mother goddess. Religious ceremonies among the Aztec were dictated by a 260 day calendar divided into 20 weeks of 13 days each. There was a solar calendar which was made up of 18 months of 20 days each, which helped the Aztec keep track of time. Aztec history was conceptualized in terms of five cosmic ages, each with its own sun. Each of these cosmic ages eventually came to a close until the fifth and final stage. This history is depicted in the stone image displayed behind me. At the center of the stone is a representation of the sun god with his tongue sticking out, suggesting thirst for blood sacrifice. The sun is surrounded by four suns, which successfully 
successively replaced each other, representing the four cosmic ages which had come before the Aztec rise. The segment around the sun represents the 20 different day names, and cardinal directions are indicated upon this stone. In terms of Aztec society, we see a divine kingship which was centered in Tenochtitlan. As you may be getting the picture, divine kingship is a core feature of many complex societies during this early period. However, the Aztec Empire was much less centralized as a society and economy than other empires we've talked about in China, North, and South America. The Aztec Empire consisted of small kingdoms, towns, which were integrated into local economies. Economic and political patterns varied based on the region in everything from land tenure to craft specialization. This meant that the Aztec Empire was not homogenous and its members did not share mutual interests in its preservation. In order to control these diverse interests and peoples, the Aztec used elected officials, intermarriage, gift giving, ideology, and military intervention. Aztec society was certainly hierarchical. At the top of society was the emperor, who was aided by two high priests. These priests were responsible for organizing state religion and education system, and in maintaining the temples to the war and water gods. They were also responsible for carrying these battle effigies during warfare and collecting sacrificial victims. Underneath the emperor and priests were the nobility, who governed over what's called cowpolis. Cowpolis were collections of families connected by blood or long association. At Tenochtitlan alone, there was 80 cowpolis. Elders of each cowpoli controlled land holdings and distributed resources to members. These cowpoli each paid tribute to their leaders who then brought that tribute to the emperor in Tenochtitlan. Underneath the nobility were a series of working class folks. Particularly high among them were the artisans or, or Tolteca, who were divided into several groups. These artisans were grouped based on kind of guilds and tasks. So you had the Pochecteca, who were long distance traders in prestigious goods. You had the slaves, you had tribute collectors, and then you had traders who went into hostile territories and spied for the state. These artisans produced a lot of fine material culture, particularly anthropomorphic ceramics, metalwork, wood carvings, stone sculptures, and turquoise mosaics. For example, the double-headed serpent mosaic depicted behind me. This mosaic in particular was associated with fertility and water, and the serpent was considered to be the bearer of bad omens. This image was likely worn as a jewel as part of a necklace by elites, worn by elites. Underneath artisans and traders were farmers who were divided into lower status field workers as well as higher groups of supervisors and specialized horticulturalists. These groups were also divided between those who worked their own land and those who paid rent and worked the land of large estates. Finally, at the bottom of the social hierarchy were slaves. Slaves were conquered people or people uh, guilty of serious crimes or debtors. They were protected by law from abuse and could buy themselves free in ways that modern chattel slavery in the United States was not, did not afford slaves the opportunity. The Aztec Empire was held together by a specialized tribute system. 
tiny groups of rulers controlled the state and with Tenochtitlan being the principal one. Everything was run for the benefit of this growing elite. So the empire was held together by an elaborate tribute system meant to fuel the desires of this growing elite. A tri tribute was assessed on conquered cities and taken in the form of raw materials like gold dust or tropical bird feathers for headdresses. There was 26 cities uh, in the Aztec Empire that did nothing but provide firewood for the royal palace alone. Metal artifacts were another major tribute item, particularly copper bells. What you see behind me here is a list of tribute items recorded in the Codex Mendoza. These, this codex records tributes owned by the conquered province of Tochtepec and included things like feathered masks, warriors' regalia, and dried fish. As with all of the complex societies we've discussed in the course, the Aztec Empire would not last forever. In 1517, Hernán Cortés sailed from Cuba to the coast of modern-day Mexico. Hearing of the Spanish arrival, the then Emperor Montezuma decided on a strategy of diplomacy. He sent gifts to the Spanish, including ceremonial costumes, gold, and silver. Impressed by these treasures, Hernán Cortés established a permanent garrison at Veracruz on the coast. In 1519, Cortés and his men marched directly to Tenochtitlan. Initially, Cortés was received peacefully and gifts were exchanged. However, this peace was short-lived. Spanish forces then began to initiate combat, taking Montezuma hostage and then re retreating into the royal palace, the Templo Mayor. Montezuma was killed in this encounter, either by a stray rock while trying to calm the populace or by the Spanish themselves. The record is still out on what was the direct cause of his death. On June 30th, 1520, after a fierce battle, Cortes gained control of the temple and set it on fire. He then proceeded to flee the city with as much treasure as he could carry. One year later, in 1521, Cortes returns to the capital, laying siege to Tenochtitlan with the support of Texacoco and Te Texcoco allies. He uses ships to block three main causeways to this major city, preventing food from entering. In addition to the siege mentality, smallpox introduced earlier drastically impacts the population at Tenochtitlan. After 93 days of resistance, the city collapses on August 13th. In general, archaeologists and historians point to two key factors that helped the Spanish pacify the rest of the empire and take control of the former Aztec land holdings. On the one hand, local communities previously exploited by the Aztec were eager to help Spanish soldiers who were promised to free them from their known tyranny. On the other hand, Spanish cavalry, along with guns, swords, cannons, and metal armor, was simply superior to Aztec cotton armor, wooden shields, and obsidian blades. In 1535, the Kingdom of New Spain was established by Don Antonio de Mendoza, who was made the first viceroy of the kingdom. This kingdom came to encompass not only the former Aztec Empire, but also all of the American Southwest, the American Southeast, and into California, as you can see in the map depicted behind me. That's all I have for you today. Make sure to uh, complete 
module six, which is based on your final paper assignment, and then prepare to take the final exam on July 8th. See you guys.